<clears throat> so without any suggestions, I'd be very glad to proceed through the planned um, presentation. But again, please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. Uh, just a question for teams. Sorry about that. My Zoom seems to have just crashed. Don't know exactly why it crashed, but uh, here we are back in the call. And happy to see uh, you and Hiena as well joined us. I was just going to ask the teams here uh, about your current efforts with regards to vision on your uh, robots. Have you planned a vision system? Uh, are you working with any other teams who have? What are your thoughts about implementing vision this year in your robot? Oh, yes, Yana. Hi, how's everyone? Happy Valentine's Day. Um, yes. Yeah, I just got home from a build, so we're- uh, <laughs> Excellent. Um, we're, we're not there yet. Um, we are still, um, you know, for the third time um, redoing our gearboxes and mm. uh, so I think right now and Ryan um, who's our programmer is on the call as well he <clears throat> I don't think they're planning much in the way of vision I mean the cameras they want to have mm. cameras so they can see um, what they're picking up and other than that I don't think um, because we're not because we're building an every bot and we're not high shooting mm. Um, we are not um, calibrating to um, any of these strips. And at the moment, we don't have any, like we don't have a limelight. We don't have it. We've never done it. Um, mm -hmm. This is our team's in our fifth year, fourth year, fourth year, fifth year. I don't know. And so we have never tried to do, but it is definitely something we'd like to in the off season. Nice work on and learn and um, figure out how to that and um, pneumatics um, try to figure that out yeah year. excellent okay but I don't see like I don't know I don't see not with our current design with the everybody I don't see a point in um, pneumatics this year because there's yeah. only heights so there's no you know and I don't see um unless you're shooting high uh, of need for a, uh, a visioning system. Yeah, and that's not how the EveryBot was designed, I suppose. With a high shooter, you'd want to uh, align a little bit better. And there are some other uh, elements in recent years that really could have used vision. Um, doing autonomous work is another occasion to have some uh, vision in your robot. Um, so I'm just wondering with you and uh, Mike, if that's something that you, we should go through anyway, just go through the vision, or we can talk about other topics that may be more relevant to this year. Very happy to do either, as we uh, should make the best use of our time here. Um, one thought is just to share like a framework of what my previous team worked on with respect to vision, just to give you a few ideas. Uh, and another is to just I have sort of an interactive session where we go over uh, parts of the uh, 
or any concerns or questions about uh, other topics that relate. So I would I, love to see a vision, uh, what that looks like and how, right. you know, how complex it is. And I'd love our programmer who's silently on the call to hear that as well. Great. Um, okay. and, and, but I'd also um, like to um, talk about general coding, uh, you know, issues and uh, hear what everyone's, where everyone's at. Okay. Well, what I could do is just speak for about half the call on the vision, give an overall view. And it's something, um, it, it's kind of a roadmap uh, to all the things you may need to put in place to get your vision working. And then the last half of the call, we could field some more general questions that might work. And good evening, uh, Brad. Welcome. And we also have Harry. Uh, welcome, Harry, as well. All right, so here we go. We'll share the screen and have a little overview of my previous team's vision. And this is definitely not your plug in a limelight, a plug and play kind of vision. We wanted to understand the whole thing, so we custom did the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, very uh, happy to have Brad and uh, Harry. It would be nice to know your team members, and uh, maybe you could put your team members in the. Uh, um, identifier on Zoom, you may see the other participants in the call. My previous team was 6162. I don't have mine there, but I think you'll see them in my slideshow here. <laughs> so here we are, session five of additional topics for FRC, February 14th. And we are actually accelerating the end of our sessions. This will be the last interactive session for the year this evening uh, with some, uh, maybe a few videos to follow up, but this will be the last interactive session. Last time we talked about state machines, what are they and when to use a state machine and how to code a state machine. And we had a few examples um, that might be used by teams to uh, create various uh, multi-step automatic functions in a robot. Press a button and it collects something or press a button and it shoots something and so on. So this session, we come back to an image that was in our earlier sessions back in October and November. And here is a breakdown of some of the systems that we find on an FRC robot. And during our sessions in October and November, we talked about uh, VS Code how to use that and the basics of Java. Uh, we had a few references to driver station over the calls uh, this year. And then we built up this image over several um, sessions. And here is a uh, robot that is equipped for vision. <clears throat> so this is the vision setup that my team had. It's not necessarily uh, one that your team may have. There is something called the limelight. It's a relatively easy approach to vision and it allows the teams to have a fairly straightforward way to integrate vision into their uh, programming tool chain. So the limelight, I think that lime comes from the lime colored green LED light that is generated to help the camera process the vision images. And so this is, um, representing our team's custom LED ring shooting out green light and a camera. And the green light was generated by an Arduino, which had a separate little program on board. Only purpose thereof was to generate green light. And then we had a Raspberry Pi coprocessor. It's in red here. And thereon, we had a Python program that was designed to begin upon boot up the Python program. It has a continuous loop, just like in the uh, robot when it's in teleoperated mode or autonomous mode. The continuous loop on the uh, vision coprocessor is uh, looking for green and yellow targets based on last year's um, game. And we'll take a look at a few of the examples through the slideshow here. 
<clears throat> so this evening I may just give a little uh, summary of the Python program we used and also a summary of how we prepared our Raspberry Pi to boot up automatically. There is a Raspberry Pi system that with a Raspberry Pi image that has been on the first website in previous years. We used to try that and I don't know, but we just never got it working, but we did get our own system working. So we just went with that. And maybe we're missing something simple, not so sure about that. But we, uh, as part of our computer science class, we wanted to learn about that anyway. And so we made our own system. So this is based on a presentation that was done for the swap posium. And we may fast forward through this a little bit. Uh, you may just note down the overall summary of, of this presentation. Uh, this little penguin represents the Linux operating system, which resides not only in your Roborio, but it resides in Raspberry Pi uh, microcomputers. And in our previous uh, session, we talked about how to set up Linux operating system uh, using the file system and the terminal. But what I will uh, focus on is something called a boot up script uh, for FRC vision. And you will see that in our presentation here. It's a little script we put into the Raspberry Pi file so that when the Raspberry Pi turns on, then it boots up to that program. And then we have the Raspberry Pi introduction, the hardware and the software. Uh, we demonstrated an emulator. I won't do that this evening, just let you know about its existence and how we use the Raspberry Pi in the vision processing. Mm, so that was a previous update about Houston. I kind of copied from another uh, presentation. So we'll skip over that for the moment and go to the Linux operating system. The uh, <clears throat> really beautiful thing for me about Linux is because it's open source, million pe millions of people uh, work on it, and pretty much all of the internet is hosted on Linux-based servers, and then we have all kinds of other uh, Linux projects, including these small computers that have popped up in recent years, such as the Raspberry Pi. Um, so we won't dwell on it too much but it's something well worth investigating. The history of Linux is the history of borderless human uh, cooperation in the computer world. There is no border in the world of Linux in that people in every part of the world have contributed to the development of this uh, project, which increasingly underpins the uh, automation and the advanced technological systems of our society. So there are lots of interesting uh, human connection and societal connection aspects for teachers to incorporate into classes when speaking about Linux. <clears throat> and it uh, has a hand played in many, many, many uh, different projects in different industries. So I'm just fast forwarding through this. And uh, here's the first thing that I will mention when you're using Linux, it's important to note the directory structure is a little different than you would find on a Windows machine. We don't have a C directory, for example. Everything starts at the root directory, which is a forward slash. And there are some important uh, directories that we see in these typical Linux distributions. When we set up our Raspberry Pi, we put uh, some special scripts in the etc folder. And then we also had the Python files that we programmed in the home folder, uh, home and then the username, probably home slash pi on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, on other devices or in other situations, you may use some of these other directories, but for the purpose of making vision, we only uh, particularly use two directories, our home directory and our etsy directory for configuration. Uh, we did talk about in a previous session uh, in the swap posium, a number of very common commands that uh, make it useful uh, or make it um, possible to interact with the Linux system here. So this would be enough for you to create a file and then edit a file in uh, Linux. Uh, yeah, lots more to that. But anyway, uh, these are just a few of the very basic commands and there are many more that you can use. The interactive shell in Linux is extremely powerful compared to the Windows one. All right, so here we come to our vision system um, components. 
we had some kind of camera. We tended to use the Microsoft Life Cam in our system. That's just a camera. I just grabbed it off the internet. There's our Raspberry Pi, size of a deck of playing cards. Uh, there are new and older Pis. You have to be aware of which one you have. You'll need at least a Raspberry Pi 3. We were using Raspberry Pi 4s last year, and they are recognizable in that they have the USB-C power supply, which comes with uh, more uh, recent Android phones. So you can use an Android phone charger or the one that comes with the Raspberry Pi. And then it has micro HDMI ports. So a drawback of the two HDMI ports is that they're smaller and you need a specialized cable. There are four USB ports, uh, ports here and we used the ethernet um, attachment or, or ethernet port to hook into the computer or the uh, uh, radio on the FRC robot which was also hooked into the Roborio. So these two devices were hooked together through ethernet cables going through the radio. Here is an LED ring and they're readily available online. We got ours off of Amazon and we had a 16 pixel version. I think this one probably has more than 16 pixels. It generated a very bright green light and we put our LED ring right around the camera. So the LED lights point away from the camera in exactly the same direction that the camera is looking so that anything that bounces back um, will come right back to the camera. And that's important when you're looking at the field elements that include retro reflective tape, which has the special property of reflecting light in exactly 180 degrees uh, back to the direction it came in. So you see a bright green reflection off of retro reflective tape from no matter which angle you're looking at it. And that's why they use this retro reflective tape so that the green light helps to pick out that particular element from all the other elements in the field. There we go. So there's our overview of our vision system. <clears throat> so now the, uh, the Raspberry Pi, one of the things you have to do is find a way to power it. So we took a cable and I forget how we did that last year. We somehow plugged this cable into our five volt power supply of the FRC robot. And I'm not quite sure how we did that now. I don't know if we tore apart wires or we, maybe we um, don't wanna say too much. I may uh, be able to see it in a diagram how we did that. Or we may have been using the Raspberry Pi 3 at any rate, we do, oh no, that's what we did. Okay, uh, maybe we'll have that in a diagram. There are some pins on the pinout over here that are zero and five volts. And we actually uh, custom uh, soldered some wires with some Arduino style jumper cables that plugged right into the power supply, the five volt power supply of the FRC robot. And uh, that helped to power the Raspberry Pi. So we did not use the USB-C power supply, we used the pins on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, um, if you don't have a Raspberry Pi, you can use a emulator. And in the presentation I gave the other time, I showed VirtualBox, which is a computer uh, emulation system that you can use to create virtual machines. So I uh, downloaded the software for a Raspberry Pi system and created a virtual Raspberry Pi. And so that's uh, for you to test. You can do all the testing of your vision system without actually hooking it up to the robot, I suppose, just to see that the vision system is working. Then when you actually want to get to the next level of testing, once you know the software has no errors, then you can uh, put it on a real Raspberry Pi. Uh, we had to install something called OpenCV, and there's quite a tutorial for that. It does have a number of steps, and a few of them ended up being a little bit technical. And uh, if you're a beginner in Linux, you may want to have someone on standby just to help because there are unforeseen error messages that can come up when you're installing something such as OpenCV on Raspberry Pi. Uh, but there are numerous tutorials online, make sure that if you use a tutorial that you have the right version of Raspberry Pi software and hardware that would correspond to the tutorial. Sometimes they're one or two years out of sync. So it, I remember going for coffee a few times during this uh, installation 
And oh yeah, I even put it down here, may you use Stack Overflow or consult friends to resolve some of the issues. Okay, so now we have a summary of the Python script. Uh, this is an overall uh, summary of the Python that we used on the Raspberry Pi. We start by initializing a connection with the camera and we initialize a connection with network tables and the network tables have to be installed with something like pip install pi network tables. And you have to have an internet connection to do that on your Raspberry Pi. So you might want to set up your Raspberry Pi with a graphical user interface and hook it up to the internet and do all the installation of OpenCV and then Pi network tables and everything like that. And then you can configure your Raspberry Pi to have a non-graphical uh, user boot up because you don't need those. Uh, you don't need to see anything on the Raspberry Pi once it's working. There's an infinite loop. So while one is equal to one, we tended to put in our infinite loops, we just let the image get analyzed for a set of shapes, determine if any of these shapes meet the criteria. If they do, we send a list of the shapes that we found. And in our case, it's yellow or green. And I'll show you this software in the form that we did it on our team last year. Okay, uh, here's a uh, view of the testing module for our Raspberry Pi. We put everything on this board so that we could take it on and off the robot while other students were working on the actual uh, robot. And then once you know everything is working, you can install it permanently on the um, robot. So there are our two cameras. We only needed one, but we just had two for testing. And there's our Arduino. And we soldered, we custom soldered this 16 uh, LED uh, green ring. You should follow the uh, instructions carefully. If you don't, it is quite easy to burn out these rings. And then we hook them right into this power supply module on the uh, robot. Our Raspberry Pi is back there and I'm not sure it's showing, but it does have a network connection to this um, radio here. All right, so you can find instructions on soldering the LED ring. Uh, we use some uh, shrink wrap there, for example, in a few places to keep all the wires together. And we color coded them according to what was happening. There are actually five attachments on the LED ring that we needed to use. One of them was for signal and two of them were for five volts and two of them for, were for ground. Okay. The LED ring, if you can't get it at Amazon, it's also available at a place called Adafruit and I'm sure a lot of other places may carry them. All right, so here's the testing phase are identifying the yellow ball. And you can see in real time, the Raspberry Pi is showing us that it's found something yellow and it's drawn a shape around it. So the, <clears throat> the way that this happens, when we boot up the Raspberry Pi, we have a um, system in Linux uh, known as a system control. And it runs system daemons, which are little programs running in the background. And we run our Pi script as a daemon. And uh, that's what we have to install in the Etsy directory, some instructions to start that when the, by, the Pi boots up. The Arduino uh, program is running also to produce the uh, green signals for the LED ring. I mentioned that before. I'm just sort of uh, mentioning that one more time here. Okay, here is a little script that this is the script that we used on our Pi, and we installed this in this particular file, in this particular folder under the name vision.service, the file name vision.service. We put that code into the vision.service file in this directory. And then there are a few commands that we use to start it and stop it, enable it. And those four commands, starting and stopping, enabling, and daemon reload. If you want to reload the daemon after modifying uh, some of the code in here, you'll note, you'll have to get the um, file names exactly correct. In this case, our 
uh, vision program on the Pi was in the home directory under the Pi users home directory and the name of the file video processor.py. Remembering in Linux that it's uh, case sensitive. So you must have a capital there and it must correspond exactly to how the uh, file is spelled. Okay, so there is a little uh, system control script that when it's in that folder and it's enabled and we reboot the Pi, then it's going to start this program when the Pi starts. And so that's how our vision program takes control over the Raspberry Pi when it starts. Okay, so some of the things that you might want to try, well, you can try installing a Raspberry Pi using VirtualBox if you don't have one. You can go onto Amazon. I've heard there has been some inflation. You might want to get a Raspberry Pi. And you can also take tutorials about the Linux command line, Linux scripting, uh, Python programming, and OpenCV. And you can try to get an Arduino and an LED ring, solder it up with some wires, make it look nice, and make some green light. I was really glad to have help with that. My son did a really beautiful job on that. I would have been too busy and I would have made a mess. Uh, but he did a very careful job soldering my LED ring for our class last year. And actually, I also had him do that for the first one. And then he taught about two or three other students how to do the other ones. We had a set of them. So yes, that's why I said here, form a team. There's a lot of work to do. So you want to get a number of people involved. Ideally, if you have a large class, you could have someone specializing in any one of these topics and the team comes together to make it all happen. So that was an advertisement for a coding cooperation. There's a summary of our vision system. Now I will just give a little tour through the actual code that we used on our vision processing.py file and it's up on GitLab. So let's find that in GitLab here. Okay, so this is not Java code. This is Python code, but you will notice some things look a little similar. Uh, the import statement is the same. However, we don't have semicolons at the end of the lines in Python. The key is not the semicolon, it's the tab and uh, the colon. So for example, down here, there's a colon and a tab. Those are very important in Python. Uh, and now recalling our uh, sort of outline that we had, on this Java additional uh, topics file. So there's the summary and we go here now to, um, sorry about that. Where is it? Oh yeah, it's here. There's the imports and now we go down to making a connection with the camera. So this code here was used to make a connection to the camera and we told it to sleep for a little. Okay, now it makes a, a network tables connection to our uh, Roborio. And there's the address of our Roborio. Your Roborio will have a similar address. You'll note that 6162 is our team number. And so your team number will be broken into two two-digit numbers there. And you'll have a 10 at the beginning and a two at the end. That's your Roborio's uh, address. And we get what's called the smart dashboard, which is a collection of variables in a form of a table that you can write to. And when you write a value to that table, it shows up in the Java program that you're using to operate your robot. So Python and Java in this case are connected through network tables and they communicate through network tables. Down here, uh, we have a hexagon detector. As you remember last year, we had a hexagon element in the field that was for the high shooting and the length is six indicating hexagon. So there's a shape detecting a set of commands using OpenCV 
uh, module that we uh, installed for Python. Okay, so there's the hexagon and detector. It's in the form of a method, also known as a function in Python. And we call that hexagon, hexagon detector when needed. Um, we defined two colors and this was done through some testing. There is a program called grip and we used grip and I think my student Jeff ended up writing a script that was similar to grip. Anyway, he found a way to test some color boundaries. So R, G and B, uh, red, uh, green and blue. For some reason, the green last year was rather blue and green uh, in its makeup. He defined some boundaries around which, um, or within which we find green color and yellow color, R, G, B. And I'm not sure why they're so broad. I never really reflected on that. I should have. It does strike me as a little bit lax, but it did work quite well. And here is while one is equal to one, while true. Uh, so true is just true. So it just will continue forever until you turn off the Raspberry Pi. It grabs a frame from the camera and it does some uh, color uh, manipulation, finding uh, the HSV colors, which is a color coding system. And then based on the HSV colors, it's finding whether it's yellow or green. If it is green or yellow, it does some further uh, processing. So if it has found some green contours, which are green shapes, it's going to do some further processing here. And we won't get too much into that, but uh, we are finding the center of this green object. And that is this, that's where we're aiming the ball. And down here, there's the yellow object. That's the ball on the ground. And we're doing some other things here. We're looking for the X and Y location in the camera. And then the robot in the Java, the Java program is going to interpret that data and move towards the ball or away from the ball or whatever it wants to do using the X and Y coordinates it sees in the camera. <clears throat> okay. And that's all. It's I'm going to go to the smart dashboard and put the number for the X and Y values only if it finds something green or yellow. And that's it. So this is available on um, GitLab and we will uh, try to send that. Last week's video, actually, I just remembered, it was completely lost. And I'm not sure why, when I turned off my computer, uh, we lost everything. I have the file still, it's 400 megabytes or so, it just doesn't open. So I may have to re-record some of last week's um, video. Anyway, this week, hopefully, if Zoom saves it uh, successfully to the cloud, we will um, post some links to these resources here as well. All right, I think that's a fairly quick, but a reasonably thorough introduction to the elements of the vision system that we programmed. If you want to spend less time on vision, you might want to get a limelight. If you want to have your students and your team uh, members learn more about how vision works, well, I would recommend this way, and that's what we wanted to do. And my students and I over the last few years developed this and it was quite satisfying to get it working. So uh, I'm going to stop the share for a moment here and take a look. There's a lot of uh, comment in the chat and let's see here. Oh, that's it, the hue saturation value. Thank you, Mike. I just realized he converted it to HSV, it's not RGB. Uh, when I did it on my own, I did an RGB one, but my student Jeff last year used HSV instead. So we have some discussion and welcome to our new uh, participants, Harry, Owen, and uh, Fan Fei. And uh, so the, the Arduino in the vision system it's going to just generate the green light. And actually I can show you 
a program that we use to do that. So let me um, just share my screen again. So I just went to the LED uh, website the, or the Adafruit, Adafruit. Maybe that's not the one I wanted. That's from DigiKey. Oh, here we are. Here is a NeoPixel ring at the Adafruit site. I'll go for the 16, that's what we had. And if we go to the technical details, there's probably a, oh, there's a NeoPixel library. So what we had to do with the Arduino, we had to download a specific library and follow these directions and put that into a particular file in our sketchbook. Or uh, actually, I don't think it's there. There's a place in our sketchbook where we place the library and we just follow these instructions. Okay, so we've got the NeoPixel library in our Arduino. Then we uh, take a look at one of the programs that comes with it and we customize it to generate green light. And there are some examples here. I wonder if there are, oh yeah, that is the same library there. I'm just looking to see if they actually have the examples right on the page here. I think you will find the examples once you download it and uh, work with the Arduino um, program. You can open up some of the examples. One of the examples generates colors of light and you configure it to generate green light. So there it is the, the uh, function of the Arduino. It's to uh, generate uh, green light to shine with the camera so that the camera can pick up the retro reflective surfaces in the uh, FRC play field. So there we are. And uh, yeah, at this point, I think we can open it up. If there are more questions about vision, that's great. There also may be other questions about any of the topics we've covered since October or something particular your team may be um, working with right now. And uh, any of our new participants may feel free to ask some questions uh, with regards to programming for FRC teams. So a completely open session. I see a hand. Uh, yes. Hi, William. Um, Hi. I actually, I had a question, uh, but uh, I, I'm going to ask the question about the vision first. Okay. Um, I think you touched a bit, maybe I just missed. How does the, uh, the Raspberry Pi, the program, the Python program, yeah, uh, interact with the the raw brew. Um, I, I saw the, yeah, like how does it like when it detects the shape or the color? Yeah, how does it inform the, ah. the okay. robot program that there's something? I did neglect to show the other side of that, and so let me just show first of all in this program here, the command line is right here, and here we have. Um, right at this line, we declare the smart dashboard and we call it SD. And so when I write to this smart dashboard, then the Roborio picks it up in its networking in the Java program. And we go down here, um, when it's processing the green color and it has found something and done some calculations with it, then it puts two numbers there, the X and the Y values of the uh, green object, which is a hexagon. It has to be a hexagon and of a certain size. So if the area is over 200 and it's a hexagon, then we're gonna find it's sort of the centroid, which is the center of the hexagon, and then put that as an X and Y coordinate to throw into the network and pick up in the Java program. Same with yellow, it doesn't have to be a hexagon, but it has to be something round with an area over 100. I guess that's an arbitrary number chosen by Jeff to say, well, we're close enough to the ball to be worried about it. And I think he probably did that through some trial and error. And then he found the X and Y uh, values of the ball. Well, what does that look like now in the robot program? I'm going to see if we can find 
uh, some reference to it in our code. Ah, here we are. So in our Java code, we define some network tables. So if we follow the logic of Java programming through, we should see a reference to importing network tables. And there are three values here we imported. Uh, table, table entry, and table instance. And then we define some specific instances of our network table. So you remember we called it SD in the Python program. Well, now we just call it table in the Java program. And we take all, all of our network tables and find the one named smart dashboard and we call it table in our Java program. And we're getting the X and the Y values out of the program there. And now I think this one is not the same as the uh, program that we had because we would have had CX and HX or something. We had some different names for the variables there. It's looking particularly for just X and Y, but when we programmed that other uh, version there, we were looking for the green and the yellow, uh, the hexagon and the ball. And so we would have had four of them declared here in this way. And now, once you have this uh, X entry and Y entry, then you can do some logic with them down in the uh, program. And if X entry is greater than something then we turn this way or so on and so on. And I have a feeling, I wonder if we actually did anything with that. So this particular program, I don't think we went further than that. But uh, once we're down in somewhere in autonomous, we can have some conditional statements about the values there and to decide how our robot works after that. So hopefully that it gives some idea. Uh, to get that working, you need to install network tables on the Raspberry Pi and write the X and Y values to the network tables, the ones you want. And then you have to design your Java program to pick up the same variables of the same name off of the network table and declare them as a Java variable and then work with them. You can send individual numeric values, but you can also send arrays of values or uh, as they're referred to as lists of values. Thank you, William. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not familiar with the network table. I did read it before, <coughs> kind of with just a glance through. I know there is a chapter on the w, WPI lab talk yeah. about it. I, I guess um, I'm thinking it's more like a broadcasting some data structure over the network or exactly it. Yeah, okay. it has a syntax that allows you to send variables of a particular type over the network. Okay, and I see. Then you have okay. to know what type of variables you're expecting to get and then act accordingly. Okay, so I guess uh, on the Raspberry Pi where you define uh, declare the name, the name had to be declared by the same name on the uh, on the uh, robot program. So yes. that's how you pick it up. Okay. For example, in this version of our CLI program or vision processing program, we named it HX, not just X. Whereas in the other program I showed you, I just leafed through and just found one of the programs. We had it just called X at that point. But here's a version of the program where we were calling it HX. And then there's another one down there called CX. And that was what my student Jeff decided he wanted to call the yellow and green coordinates respectively. Thank you. That's a really interesting. I don't think we're, uh, we're there yet as a Rocky team. Um, so we're still, we have many things that have to encounter. It, for... it would be really great to have like a summer camp about that and get a bunch of teams going. It would be, uh, because uh, yeah, you need to kind of build up the capabilities and I found it really tough to implement because I didn't have enough students who knew enough about it until last year. Uh, because yeah, I had a lot of turnover because most of my students were grade 12. However, 
I had students for two years because they were in IB at my previous school. And once we got a batch of two year students, then they had built up enough expertise to put it into action on our team. During the competition, which uh, I'm trying to think of for the vision system, where, uh, like which scenario that do you actually use the vision system? So uh, I remember watching footage from the 2020 competition and as far as I can see, there were some robots at an arbitrary location on the field, and they would seemingly press a button and the robot would perfectly point towards the uh, ball target or the whatever we're calling them, those little yellow balls, forgot their names now. <laughs> and then they would get 10 of them in in a row. And so there's a lot of coordination involved there, a precise, aiming of a projectile is one of the scenarios. And then an automated uh, approach to one of the field elements is another one. Maybe you have to, like for example, when we had to deliver the gears in 2017, if you wanted to do that autonomously, you may have had to have your robot uh, work a little bit precisely to line up with the, uh, the gear to drop it off autonomously. So that's another one. When you have a field element and you need to precisely interact with it, there's a good place where you could use vision. Uh, so it helps you to be precise and uh, reliable as long as you have a reliable vision system programmed and that takes a little work. Thank you. That's all good information for future, uh, I guess, <laughs> competition. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so yeah, most welcome to follow up and maybe uh, that would be a nice thing to organize for some teams, get some vision going. We'd have to have a workshop with it. it it's hard to do in just these little uh, calls here, but maybe that's enough for your team to get started in research and get a lot of it done or whoever, uh, however we want to do that. Yeah. Um, um, if I may, I do have sure. a question. It's not about the vision. Sure. Um, Last, uh, over the weekend, the students um, um, finally got a chance to test the new raw reel. Uh, oh, yeah. 2. Whoa, nice. And uh, there's, well, one of the students read the instructions, so apparently there's quite a bit of change there. Mm. Uh, so we have to run back and forth, try to get the SD card adapter and the right to the firmware onto it. Um, oh, wow. Um, then we're having, I think, to the end of the Sunday, we're having trouble to re-image the raw reel, like 2.0. Uh, so and we're going to try that in the next few days. I'm not sure if you have any experience with the, the 2.0 or... This is actually brand new, and this is something I will uh, dig into with a few of the teams in this area, see if I can play around with one. Uh, so I haven't played with a 2.0 yet. So uh, definitely something to look into. Uh, do you have an idea as to what was the issue with the imaging it? Was it uh, denying permission, not connecting, just giving an error? What were some of the things happening? That uh, weren't... Yeah, when we uh, first plug in, because we we have a, we have a older version of Rob Reel from we bought it offline uh, from someone from, from a previous team, mm. and we never had a trouble using the imaging tool to write it. And this one, right off the bat, when we connect. Uh, the power light was always red. Ah, and, and there was we constantly while well, we unplug a lot of wiring, just make sure until to the point there's nothing else to connect to it. Ah. And then we go back to the WPI lab and then <clears throat> we start reading the traction. We realize it's a it's a sort of the two step. You have to write something, use a special tool to write something to the SD card. Ah. So without, if the SD card is empty or there's no firmware on it, it's, I guess they changed the design. So there's no memory, maybe ah, yes. wrong. there's no memory embedded inside the rob reel and everything mm -hmm. like was inside the rob reel memory. It's now is on the SD card. 
Okay, so, that kind of makes sense. It's kind of going to the architecture of the Raspberry Pi in a way. Um, yeah, so that's that's why I mentioned that I had to run back home to grab the, the adapter to, that we can plug into the computer and uh, yeah. to write the, the whatever the ROM the or the, image. Yeah, to write the SD card. Then we get a hurdle of the first step. Then we're having trouble to using the imaging tool because for some reason it doesn't detect that there's a robbery over there. Okay, a few things that come to mind. What version of Windows were you using? Is it possible I, you're using Windows 11? It's, uh, I haven't checked. I think, I think it's a Windows 10 because the, okay. the, uh, the, the task bar is not in the middle, so it's on the side. Mm -hmm. So it's probably most likely it's still Windows 10. And then in previous years, when we were doing things like imaging, depending on what we were imaging, sometimes the computer's own firewall or network adapters had to be double checked. And sometimes you have virtual network adapters that work through USB. Other times you have literal or uh, real network adapters. And then you have the firewall that may have to allow things to travel back and forth. So those are all things to check in the case of something not connecting. This having not seen the new Roborio, so maybe there could be a different issue. And uh, is the power supply still 12 volts for the new Roborio? uh to be honest i'm not really sure because uh, we have a student that uh, we divide into different group so the wiring team they hook up everything so i assume like according to the light once we got the sd card written the power light was fine so yeah okay I yeah I, I assume that part is uh, the same then it should be okay yeah yeah okay so there it seems like a, a firewall and or uh, network adapters and things like that could be an issue but there are numerous things that can be uh, a challenge yeah. with those kinds of setups. Yeah. So Today, so I just uh, dig into my box in my basement and find another uh, printer cable, and uh, oh. we're going to try that tomorrow and to see what happens. So nice. very unlikely it's a cable, but... No. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, yeah, lots of good troubleshooting opportunities here. Yeah. I'll have to research the Roborio too and see what has changed. Oh, well, it. it's uh, I guess it's it was a surprise to me. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, that's a, that's a quite different. Hmm. So. Uh, FRC coders all around Ontario. Uh, still very happy to answer any questions. It has been a really great time to be with you every week since October almost. And uh, yeah, really look forward to seeing you at some tournaments. And yeah, I'm always happy to receive your emails and interact that way. And I've been doing that since October with various participants. So. Uh, yeah, with that, uh, I will really hope that this session has recorded. I'll upload that one and maybe a few other little sort of summary uh, videos to sort of wrap it all up. That's what I would have done in the next two Monday evenings, but I'll probably do those asynchronously and still welcome your communication once we post those. Well, uh, Thank you very much again for your participation throughout the year. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing everyone sometime very soon. Thanks. Thanks, William. Um, Mike, I don't know if you can see the chat. Mike has a question about um, oh, with restrictions being lifted. Or is there any ch chance that they'll be uh, expanding the number of people permitted? So the way the FRC did it, because there was so much uh, volatility with respect to societal developments, we have a two-stage announcement process. One was already done for the Hummer event, and that's a month before the Hummer event. We honed in on 15, and each event has its numbers determined by a few factors. One reason that the Hummer event was kept at 15, it's going to be the first large event for FRC since the COVID era started. And it's also gonna be the first large event at Humber with an outside group since the COVID era. And so we're being extra cautious with Humber. 
there are indications in recent times that restrictions have become less restrictive and therefore there may be some upward pressure on the numbers at the future events and it's not anticipated that this will happen at Humber. Even so, there will be a final call made about a week before to help teams do their final planning. And I would really hope that we could open it up more. Uh, as a, according to the current news today, there are going to be very few restrictions left in Ontario on March 1st. But I'm not holding my breath until March 1st. Then ask me about that. <laughs> um, so, Keep an eye out for the announcement about a week before Humber, which is coming up soon, but also don't hold your breath about Humber because of this being our first event. So it's uh, it will take organizations a little bit of time to respond to the changing restrictions as well. So the uh, it takes it has taken way too many hours to develop our 30 pages of COVID protocols. <laughs> And uh, so developing our exit from those protocols will be not as simple as just turning them off. So there are many things to consider. So short answer, I really hope so. The long answer, what I just said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have, um, uh, we had a discussion, uh, uh, not today, on Friday about um, a rule and we just maybe, uh, short of rereading the game manual you could you could um settle a bet um can the uh robot be in contact during the hang with anything and still count as a climb other than the ground whoa wow well my first intuition is can't be touching the ground that's a detail i don't have memorized but i'm so you're asking me not to look in the game manual? Well, I'm just, I'm, you're just, I'm trying to save myself having to reread the game manual and um, send, set a challenge while um, with the team to do so. But maybe someone else knows. I recall seeing that you could be touching uh, the sidewall and that you could be touching another robot and it still counts as this hang, but there was a dispute about this. Um, and in the busyness of building, we haven't checked yet. Oh. Um, rule G3208 and G209 seem to be relevant in this regard. Uh, the short, let them climb and don't climb on each other are the names of those rules. There are extra details, of course. So I have a feeling a robot may not contact directive, directly or transitively through a game piece or cargo or uh, an opponent robot contacting mid, high, and traversal rungs or an opponent robot whose bumpers are at least partially in their hangar zone in the 30 final seconds of the match and don't climb on each other. <laughs> so a robot may not be fully supported by a partner robot. Those are two rules from the game manual. I just pulled up right there. Mm. Put them down here. Sounds, uh, sounds good. No, I, I think the piece that we were wondering is because it's right up against the side. It could be up against the side wall and it could be against oh. the, it could be against the, um, <clears throat> the, like if it's touching the apparatus itself on the sides is the question. Oh, I see on the sides. And in that case, we may have to go to the scoring because maybe you're allowed to climb on the side, but maybe that doesn't guarantee you a score. Oops. Scoring coming up here. Ah, hanger, low mid traversal. Oh, it's not saying much about what that constitutes. Wow. And you know, that's the kind of question that tends to end up on some of the clarification updates that we get. Because I don't see any details about the side. It just says you have to be hanging off of the low, middle, or high rung. Uh, 
it makes sense that not touching the floor, but if you're, I remember in one of the first updates, um, there was a conversation about the, that that was different from any previous hang that you could be leaning on the, like, if you have three robots, theoretically side by side on, uh, on say a middle round. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, one could be touching as long as it's off the ground. It, I don't know. I, I'll guess. Well, I guess I'm going to have to go digging. Yeah, I don't see any reference to the sides, though, and that might end up getting clarified. But if you keep quiet about it, maybe you can design a robot that can climb up the side of the wall to support its climb. Of, but that also sounds complicated. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. I, th thank you. Does anyone else, anyone else want to jump in? Yes, I believe you could be in contact with other robots or with the um, the structure as long as you're not supporting it. Like mm. you can't latch onto the structure and climb like that, or you can't latch onto the wall, things like that. But contact is okay, as long as it's not supporting you. Thank you, forward. Mike. Thank you. That's what mm. I, that's, that means I won the bet. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yeah. My intuition would have been to probably stay away from the wall because you, <laughs> those kind of details end up getting asked and then they're overruled. I, I'm wondering, Mike, where you might have seen that because I didn't kind of a quick perusal of the rules. I didn't really see anything referencing the wall, but maybe it's been pro, uh, like clarified somewhere. It was mentioned in one of the team updates. Yes, I think it was it is. six or eight okay. um, because somebody did the math and it's theoretically possible to drive partway up the side wall <laughs> and drive directly onto the traversal. I see. Okay. Okay, so there, there's the answer there, and it's the updates that kind of uh, update us on that. I haven't been paying attention to those as closely as I should, perhaps. So, uh, yeah, it's always good to stay updated with those things, because as the community engages with the problem for the year, we come up with these uh, insights and questions and then clarifications result. Oh, I'm wondering if uh, you, you have a hand up. No, William, I probably just uh, forgot yeah. to lower it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No worries. All right, so I hope everyone has a great evening and we'll look forward to seeing everyone very soon. Do you know where you're going to be this year, William? Where were we yes, I will be in uh, the first weekend at Humber. The next time will be Waterloo. I'm not going to York. Although I may be able to go to this the last day of York because they overlap only partially. Then I'll be going to, uh, I don't think I'm scheduled to be at Windsor, but my former team is going to Windsor. So I may just go there because my son is driving their bus. And then going to St. Mary and then the Ontario Championships. So I get to go to a few more of them. There's only one overlapping weekend there. I'm not going to one or the other event. I guess North Bay overlaps with me and Windsor as well. So not getting to go to North Bay. So I'm, how about your team, Yana? I know you probably are going to North Bay. I'm not yeah. sure what your second event is. <laughs> yes, we, um, we're going to York. And, oh, York. Um, and so we won't see you there. Um, oh, no on the first day i think we're at york and then second and then north bay is just the one day event now oh, yeah. and, then, and then uh provincials so i booked yes. hotel oh, <laughs> well, why not <laughs> good good that's good so hopefully we'll see everyone at provincials yes so that oh that'd be great <laughs> thank you mike for checking the rule number on the uh the 6.41 on the hanging okay i'm gonna i'm looking it up right now Great. Anyone else uh, going to be at York or North Bay so we can meet up and say hey? And I'll be at York. Excellent. Oh my. Awesome. We'll look for you. Great. All right. So. Good night to all and until soon.
Thanks, William, for everything. We've taught, learned, learned a lot over the past few months. It's been really great working with everyone, and thank you. And I'm sure we'll be in touch with when we, when we uh, first time try to load our code and it doesn't work. Excellent. Please. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.